So uh, start again with uh, Sir Michael Berry. And the only instruction I have for you, we are recording in the back, and if we do a good enough job, we'll have to see how it turns out. <coughs> Maybe we'll get to use some of these. But please, if you have a question, hit speak, and then speak, and then. Good. Something I didn't say yesterday, which I should have said. I mean, I, I, I pointed out that in a sense, I knew about super oscillations 20 years before I wrote about them it, because of these phase singularities. But what I didn't say is the fact that why we studied them had nothing to do in the beginning with super oscillations. We realized that there was topological fine structure, but the real reason for studying them is that they're optical singularities. And this has now developed into a rich subject. I mean, just as these vortices touch on the wider subject of phase singularities, as I explained, so the vortices have another uh, provenance, uh, which is this, that uh, we now understand that you get a lot of insight into physical theories by looking at their singularities. And in the case of physics where you can describe phenomena on a number of different levels. Different singularities appear at different levels of description. And the physical phenomenon where you have most levels of description is light, optics. You have geometrical optics, you have scalar wave optics, you have vector wave optics, you have quantum optics. And at each of these levels, singularities play a major role except the last one, and they're, they're very, very different from each other. I mean, in geometrical optics, the singularities are the caustics. In uh, scalar wave optics, the singularities are the vortices I talked about. In vector wave optics, I didn't speak about it, and I won't. There are polarization singularities. And uh, these appear when you study phenomena, which it's appropriate to understand at different levels. So that's the context in which we have, for many years, uh, studied phase singularities along with these other singularities. So that's the, you know, it wasn't that I was stupid in not making this connection, or I should have done long before. It's that the focus was on the singularities, which is a different, uh, different direction. Anyway, now something different. So I want to talk today about the origin of uh, these weak values. And I want to talk about the way in which I understand the original ideas of Yakir. Um, May I see your lovely person? Yes. What are you doing? It seems to be rubbing a little bit. So okay. Try to it. Mm, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, which is to do with weak measurement, of course, which I have alluded to but haven't uh, uh, tackled head on. Well, now I'll do that. And I'm aware that um, what I'm doing. Um, and this is work with Pragya Shukla, uh, who will be mentioned several times, uh, my collaborator in India. What um, uh, we're aware of is that there's a lot of Chapman work which overlaps what I'm going to tell you, but I want to tell it in the way I understand it. Do you understand that? Okay. So here's the idea, and it's familiar to most of you. You want to measure an operator A in some pre-selected state. And you want to measure it by briefly coupling it to a pointer whose coordinate is Q. So you measure the, eventually you'll make measurements by seeing how Q changes. And the initial state of that pointer, it's a quantum pointer. It's some wave function, localized, probably, otherwise it's not a very good pointer, um, uh, with a wave function, phi of Q. And the novelty of uh, Yakir's approach, oh, oh, sorry. I'm going to assume this phi of Q is real. Why? Because then the expectation value of momentum is zero. That's sensible, because otherwise you're looking at a pointer that starts out moving, which is a pretty silly kind of pointer to use. You don't have to. You can include um, uh, pointers that are moving, but why, why do that? I mean, it's a sort of foolish thing. So that's what I'll assume. Now, the distinctive feature Yakir introduced was that you post-select with a final state. That is, you don't look at all the results of the measurement. You look only at those ones compatible, in a certain sense, with a final state. And then, the final point of state in this formalism is not normalized. 
It's the overlap of, uh, it's the matrix element of your initial and final states with the um, evolution operator that operates for a little while um, uh, coupling your operator you're going to measure to the momentum. Why exponential momentum? Because that's the shift operator. You want to have a shift of a pointer. So that's the object which uh, uh, we'll be concerned with. Now, I'm going to consider cases where this operator has a bounded spectrum because we're going to be interested in super shifts where the pointer gives you a result outside that spectrum. And just for simplicity, let it be from minus n to plus n. It doesn't really matter, but let it be. Now, so if you introduce the position representation, uh, you've got two spaces. You've got the space of the pointer with its position momentum, and you've got the space of the operator A. Well, in position representation, momentum of the pointer is the derivative operator, which, of course, exponentially is the shift operator. And if you work in terms of the eigenstates n of the operator you're measuring, then you find that um, the pointer wave function, unsurprisingly, is a superposition of copies of the initial pointer state. Each one of them is shifted by one of the eigenvalues a n. That's a very natural, simple thing. And these coefficients, which will play a role, are these um, uh, two overlaps of your initial and final state with the nth eigenstate of the operator a. OK. Now, I just want to make a comment. You see, these c's are crucial. They don't determine the initial and final states. Indeed, you can have different pairs of initial and final states with the same coefficient c. So coefficient c is what matters. So here's an example. If you take the initial and final states as being sums over the eigenstates of A, of course they always will be, but uh, times these different combinations of the modulus and the phase of the C, but with these random phases you can show that uh, this object uh, is in fact just Cn, it doesn't depend on these phases alpha n. So just a point to bear in mind is that uh, these C's can correspond to many different, uh, I mean this is just one set, but are infinitely many different initial and final uh, states. Now, the familiar measurement is where the initial and final states are the same. The, the excuse me, the pre and post selected states are the same. And then these C's are never negative, and you get the conventional um, measurement. You'll find that your weighted sum of the shifted pointer states must always be centered within the spectrum of the operator. But if the pre and post selected states are different, these C's can have different phases. They can, for example, have alternating signs. And then the overlaps can interfere with each other and interfere destructively even. And then a mathematical miracle happens. It can, it can happen. It's, uh, an, you need the Fourier transform of the pointer to decay fast enough, and I'll talk about that later. But if that happens, then the pointer wave function almost cancelled by destructive interference, can be resurrected very far from the spectrum, super shifted by the super weak value. And the super weak value is this. Uh, this is what you get, and I'll explain where it comes from in a minute. This is the, the, the common result. The, um, the uh, uh, final pointer is the shifted initial state of the pointer, shifted by something which I'm calling the real part of AW. Um, I'll show you in a minute what it is. But multiplied by this overlap, which can be extremely small if, uh, if there's two states are nearly orthogonal. And uh, there's this familiar formula for the weak value. It's the uh, matrix element of your operator between the initial P and post selected states divided by their overlap. And uh, you can write that now in terms of the spectrum of A, and it involves these uh, coefficients that I've called C. Now, of course, I haven't told you where this comes from, but uh, when the pre and post is are nearly orthogonal, then uh, this weak value can be very large. I mean, if there's zero, almost zero down here, it can be way outside the spectrum of A. But the pointer wave function is very weak there, as I've told you, because of this, uh, um, because of this uh, scalar product outside. Now, I'm going to illustrate all this with equally spaced eigenvalues. It doesn't really matter, but it saves a lot of writing. 
So I'm letting these eigenvalues be multiples of n and do some rescaling to get rid of the multiple. And then the pointer wave function is the sum of shifted superposition of copies at integer points between minus n and n, 2n plus 1 of them. Now the weak value is uh, then, it's the n-weighted sum of, this, that's where the operator comes in of, uh, with these coefficients, and the denominator is the sum of these coefficients. Um, it's very helpful to introduce the momentum wave function. We're going to have to do that. So here's the pointer, initial pointer wave function. If it's broad, the momentum wave function is narrow. If it's a narrow pointer, as in conventional experiments, the, uh, uh, the um, Fourier transform is broad. So now, the same thing, you can write the pointer wave function as the um, Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of the pointer times something. And that something is this sum where these coefficients now have uh, Fourier um, exponentials multiplying them. Um, make a comment. If you ask what is S of 0, the sum of these C's is just the overlap of the pre and post selected state. If you ask about the derivative of at 0 times i, then uh, this weak value, uh, th this is just the weak value, and it's the um, derivative of the logarithm of, the, uh, of this function s. Um, and this, what this is, it's what I call the Chapman relation between the Taylor and the Fourier coefficients um, of, the, um, of, uh, 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 of this function. Now, let this function s of p be super-oscillatory. Now, here it is again. Here it is. It's super-oscillatory if... Uh, if you have uh, an exponential here who's, who's uh, with, with a constant greater than n. So here we are, n times a, a is greater than 1. Now, a confusion one might fall into, which I want to eliminate now, it's certainly I had it for a long time, is that um, this p is the old x when we talked about functions of x. And the q, which is the Fourier variable, is the old k. This is the old wave number in these, for example, waves that I talked about. It's the local wave vector, which can be very large, super shifted. Here it's the Q, it's the pointer that's going to be super shifted in a moment. OK, so here we are again. That's the same uh, function. Um, now, uh, when this is the case, you put this exponential in here, and then you simply find that you have the Fourier transform back again, and you have now this shift by a times n, if this is the case. Now, that's the super-shifted pointer in the standard way of, uh, of thinking about it. Now, there's a difficulty with that approximate argument, which is why I call it a mathematical miracle, is it assumes that this p integral is dominated by the small p region where the super-oscillatory, where the function super-oscillates, but we know from all experience of super functions, that this is where the function is very small. So how can it be that this integral uh, is dominated by the range where this function super is extremely small in order to get this uh, value? Well, the answer is it, this will work if this Fourier transform decays sufficiently fast so that the Fourier transform of the pointer wave function decays sufficiently fast to overwhelm the enormous anti-Gaussian, often, increase in the uh, um, super oscillatory function away from the region where it super oscillates. Now, that requires a broad point of state. It's kind of obvious. If you want to get these um, different uh, contributions from each of the eigenvalues, shifted copies, to interfere with each other, you have to have a broad enough uh, 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 point of state. Now, broad enough point of state involves a, a narrow Fourier transform. So, of course, here in this phenomenon, which looks as though naively it contradicts the uncertainty principle, we actually use the uncertainty principle to make it work. Now, so we're going to explore this in detail with this canonical super oscillatory function. Here it is. I'm slightly different from how I wrote it before, but it, I want it to be. 
two n here and half p and half p there, it just suits. And I've put a little prefactor here. So let's remember, remind ourselves of this function. Um, well, here it is. It's a complex function. We can look at the real part, the imaginary part. It varies enormously, so let's look at the logarithm. And uh, close to the origin, these are the super oscillations. I've chosen n equals 10 and a equals 3. It oscillates here three times faster than you would expect. OK. Um, the overlap is s of 0, which is 1 over uh, a to the 2 n. a is greater than 1, so it's tiny, tiny, tiny. And at pi, I've chosen, so this is actually 1. You can just see that it is uh, when you get to pi. Um, now, as I've shown you before, these Fourier coefficients um, have these alternating signs. That's what's enable, what enables the, uh, um, the almost destructive interference to occur. And it's remarkable how close to Gaussian the moduli of these uh, uh, coefficients are. I showed you that, and I'll show it again now. So here's the, um, here's the modulus, very Gaussian, centered on n divided by a. So uh, nothing super oscillatory appears there. The super oscillations are way, way over here, which we will discuss. Uh, so this is the Gaussian, and it's of width 1 over root n. So as you increase n, this gets narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, but then the super oscillations get more and more dramatic. Very interesting phenomenon. Now, we need a little bit more uh, than this. We need to see how, let me show you back again. We, whoops, I'm sorry, excuse me. We need to see how this function grows. This is the anti-Gaussian growth. It's Gaussian around here, anti-Gaussian here, because we need to know what contributes to that integral. Okay. So uh, the anti-Gaussian growth, here it is, e to the plus p squared, near the origin, and away from the maximum, e to the minus, let e to be the distance from pi, e to the minus e to squared. So that's normal Gaussian uh, behavior. So anti-Gaussian and extremely small. So let's look at the first kind of pointer. Let the pointer be a Gaussian. So here's the phi of q and the phi of p, a Gaussian of width delta. So this is the decay that has to compensate this anti-Gaussian growth. And then there's a simple condition for that. You just write it down. The factor in the integral, then, is uh, the product of two Gaussians, one of which is an anti-Gaussian, one of which is an ordinary Gaussian. The overall coefficient of p squared has to be positive. And uh, this means a supershift has to be large enough for the Gaussian decay to dominate the super oscillation, anti-Gaussian, the root really, it, but not too large because you don't want the pointer so big that when it's super shifted, it overlaps the spectrum. You want to be outside the spectrum. So there's a little condition for that. And if you look in the plane of the n, which the large n, which is the asymptotic that gives you this range of super oscillations, and uh, the width of the pointer, there's this region here. And these dots are points where I'm going to show you what the pointer does. Chosen a equals 3. So let me show you how the supershift emerges as the pointer gets wide, wave function gets wider and wider. And from the conventional point of view, it's a bad pointer because you want a narrow pointer to measure precise. But for this, you want a broad pointer to get this phenomenon of the resurrection very far away from the, from the spectrum. OK, now, um, in all of these pictures, these, this is, these are the pointer wave functions. And the spectral range is are these, um, uh, where n is chosen, n equals 10, minus 10 to plus 10 are these gray bars. Now here, we have delta equals 1. And here, you see the pointer wave function is comfortably inside the spectrum. Nothing surprising there. But as you increase delta, 3, 5, 6, it starts to leak outside, 7, 10. And now, you see this super shift. Almost none of it is actually in the spectrum. Almost all of it is outside the spectrum. But here's 10 to the minus 11, and here's 0 0.005. This is why these are called weak measurements, because you're only measuring this tiny little um, rare 
phenomenon of the states compatible with the with the um, with the post selection. Um, you can look at the mean pointer position. I mean, I've just showed the whole wave function, but the mean pointer position saturates at the weak. Oh, I should go back. Excuse me. There's something else I didn't tell you. Um, whoops. Um, here, you've reached 30. A equals 3, N equals 10. The weak value is indeed 30, so it's centered on there. Um, so you can calculate the mean point of position. It's the mean value of the wave function, appropriately normalized. And uh, you can show that when delta is large, it's not difficult, you get the original position, let, perhaps it's 0, plus this real part of the weak value. So. Um, what about the imaginary part? This isn't going to play much of a role. I will say something more about it tomorrow. But um, if the imaginary part of this weak value isn't zero, it means that at the end of this weak measurement, the pointer is actually moving. Um, and uh, here's the result. The mean value of the momentum of the pointer after the measurement is proportional to the, it's a curious thing, proportional to the imaginary part of this weak value times the variance of the original um, uh, wave function. Uh, this is a result, it's a very beautiful paper by Richard Joser. He was my colleague in Bristol. He's now moved to Cambridge. And I didn't know this result when he did it. It was before we started thinking about these weak measurements. But um, it's the clearest place where this is described is, is his paper. Um, I won't speak about that again until maybe a little bit tomorrow. Um, OK. So the mean shift of the pointer, as I, as I said, well, here it is. It's just some in little integral you can calculate. So it starts out, uh, it, it saturates onto the weak value. In this case, it's 30, as you increase the width of the pointer. OK. And again, this is the spectral range. It's between minus 10 and 10, but I, nothing happens on the negative side. Good. Now let's look at the a Lorentzian pointer, OK, as a different analytic structure. So here it is, 1 over 1 plus q over delta, delta's the width, squared. Fourier transform is exponential, e to the minus mod p times delta. OK, now the factor in the integrand now, well, you've got the anti-Gaussian part, which I wrote here in full. It's, it's anti-Gaussian near the origin. And here you've got the decay caused by the, um, of, 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 of the pointer. But now, you, this is a fairly tricky analysis. You do get a supershift, indeed. And you get the supershift if the width of the pointer is some critical value um, greater than uh, n, essentially. And this saturates onto a weakened Lorentzian. OK, again, it's a copy. Here it is. Um, but uh, now there's something not so good that happens, because indeed you get this saturation, but there's always an overlap with the spectrum. It's not what you get with the Gaussian, because it's not pow uh, exponential. It's not powerful enough. It's less powerful than a Gaussian decay to uh, overcome this uh, anti-Gaussian. And the residue of that uh, impotence is the, uh, is the fact that you overlap the spectrum a bit. But still, the average value does tend, in the end, to the, uh, to the weak value. Um, how about a pointer that's exponential? It's the other way around. Pointer is exponential. The Fourier transform is Lorentzian. That's a very slow decay. So this is a pointer, as I say, whose Fourier transform has a long tail and doesn't decay fast, as you would like it to. Well, at the integrand then, e to the minus 2 log p, if you look what happens near the origin. And here's the anti-Gaussian. Well, that log p is never powerful enough, actually. It's a very shallow minimum, independent of delta, and there's no super shift. Look, here's delta is 0.1. That's a conventional kind of measurement. You're well within the spectral range. Here is the spectral range. And you've got these little exponentials, e to the mod something, little copies of the pointer, as you would expect with a narrow pointer. And there you see them. Now, as you increase the width of the point, you don't shift the maximum at all. But what you do do is you change the shape. And it's actually kind of interesting to change the shape. The result of all these overlaps, it's one of these um, 
kind of theta function sums. I don't want to go into details of that, but it's a, it's a theta function type sum um, in the end, which you can then reduce down and you can get something which has these saw teeth. That's the main point. So instead of exponentials, you get saw teeth, but you get no super shift. So you really do need the pointer to be broad and have an analytic structure so its Fourier transform decays fast enough. You can look at pointers whose Fourier transform decay faster than Gaussian. There's various things you can play with, but I've given you the essence of, this, of the story. Now, this is when you have a large number, n, of states. In that model um, supersurgery function, we've got the n, which represents the number of eigenvalues in the spectrum. But even if you've got two eigenvalues, you can have a rudimentary supershift, and uh, there'll be examples of that later in, among these lectures. So let's take them at 1 and minus 1. And for convenience, let's take the strengths of them determined by a parameter theta, as I've shown here, cos theta minus pi over 4, sine theta minus pi over 4. The reason being that the overlap, which is the sum of the c's, is 0 when theta equals 0. So that's where you expect to get supershifts. OK. Now, the point away function, then, is shifted towards plus 1, shifted towards minus 1, with the corresponding coefficients. And the mean point of position, if you have a Gaussian initial wave function, it's just easy to calculate with that. Uh, here it is, is the mean point of position. And it depends on this parameter, theta. And, of course, on delta. And the super shifts require a certain condition. It's when q is greater than 1, because the spectrum is minus 1 to 1. So q greater than 1 is a super shift. Um, that's a condition. And as the width becomes very large, you do get uh, uh, a, a saturation. The weak value is the difference divided by the sum. The difference is because you've got these coefficients n, plus 1 and minus 1. Uh, and that's cotangent of theta. So indeed, the weak value can be arbitrarily large when theta is zero, the initial final state is orthogonal. And this is the region, now it's unfortunately the shaded region, where you get the super shift in the space of the parameter and the delta. You see, when the parameter is very small, you get a large super shift, and otherwise it depends on the width of the, width of the, um, of the wave function. And here's a picture, you see, which you'll see again. Um, uh, tomorrow, or tomorrow, the next day, I can't remember, tomorrow. Um, so here's the pointer, final pointer. It's um, super shifted. Uh, I've chosen theta is, doesn't matter, one over one fifth root two, quite a small value. Um, but you see that you can't avoid this uh, overlap with the spectral range. The spectral range uh, here, it's um, minus three to three. So minus one to one, excuse me. That's the spectral range. But the, the, and here's the super shift, but there's a huge overlap. That's because 2 is uh, very far from large n. But still, in rudimentary um, uh, way, you can have it. And I'm going to show you, as I said, an example of that tomorrow. OK. So that's how we think about uh, super shifts and relation with super oscillations. It's a Fourier relation which comes when you consider this, uh, this um, process that Yakir envisaged. Now I want to move to something else. Because there's something else other than vortices that was known beforehand where there was an intrinsic dependence on a phenomenon that we now recognize as being super oscillations. Yes. What is the physical interpretation of weak values for orthogonal initial and final state? When ah, it's good a question. Um, it's um, uh, I think you can only ha can only be meaningful in terms of some limiting case where the weak values. Ah, oh, I'll tell you exactly. Uh, the physical interpretation is that you have an infinite valued measure, but you'd never measure it because the strength is very small. The weakness is proportional to the overlap. So you never measure it. So it's a limiting thing. You will never experience it. No, you can't. No, you never experience it. Exactly that. Mm. So. And then it doesn't end up in the probability sum. Meaning the sum of probability, even no matter how small it is, it won't Yeah. Yeah. Not in the limit. Not in the limit. But as you approach the limit, of course, 
you know, if, if you're prepared to wait long enough to measure these very unlikely things, you could, in principle, measure a super shift as large as you like, but uh, not infinitely large, because then it would never happen. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. No, that's what that, hence, I mean, that, there's a, a confusion because, you know, these are called weak measurements. But the thing that actually measures a very strong shift, but the weakness is the probability that's going to happen. That's the point. I suppose in retrospect, one could have thought of a different terminology, but it's now well established. Okay. During the war, the Second World War, there was a lot of work on radar, and in particular, you want to send beams. Uh, from an antenna and uh, something very wonderful was discovered by Shelkunov uh, which uh, is precisely the interplay between super oscillation which we've talked about and super resolution which is things that you would think are forbidden by classical optics just like the behavior near vortices smaller than the wavelength this is diff a different example later developed by Toraldo de Francia, who I'm going to feature in a little while. So, and then, and then for the book celebrating Yakir's 80th birthday, I wrote an article connecting the now way we think about super oscillations with uh, this antenna theory. So here's a, what's called an end fire array. It's a, uh, a series of uh, sources, oscillating sources, oscillators, radiating, they're little spherical waves. And uh, you're interested in uh, what happens forward of this structure at different directions. There'll be a radiation pattern in the far field. Let's only consider that for the moment, uh, which will depend on direction in a way that uh, depends on the interference of all these different sources. Now, in particular, uh, and of course, it's in three dimensions, so it's a conical structure. In particular, they're what are called in that world, this world, cones of silence, which is, which is angles where the intensity is zero, separating the different side lobes of the diffraction pattern of this, um, of this uh, antenna. Now, here's the point. You can choose the amplitudes and phases of these sources to make the radiation pattern arbitrarily narrow, even if the total length of this array is much less than the wavelength. That's called super gain or super directivity, narrower than Rayleigh. Because you've got the Rayleigh limit, where you've got something that is of a given size and what's its radiation pattern. You would never expect. Um, you would expect that if you want a very um, narrow beam, you must have a big source. OK, and with a precise uh, definition, which we'll get to. OK, how can that happen? Well, here's the radiation pattern. I'm thinking that uh, you excite these sources with amplitudes A, and it's very convenient to put a phase factor. You could include it in the A, but it's very convenient to include it here. Uh, so you start the default, if all the A's are 1, is that each of the um, sources emits uh, with a phase that increases as you go from the back to the front. And the reason for that is that you've got this very nice form here, sine squared a half theta for each of them. Right. So here's the picture again. And uh, this factor comes, it comes from the path difference in an elementary way. There are n of them. Now, if you have equal amplitudes, as in the school examples, you can calculate this sum. And you get this sink function with uh, side lobes. And uh, uh, you can look for k is the wavelength, wave number. It could be 1, but let, let it be. You, uh, you need to make the uh, antenna very large, kl is 20 pi, in order to get this rather narrow radiation pattern. There are, and there are some little tiny side lobes in here, and here, and here. This is a polar plot of the square of, this, um, uh, 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 of the amplitude in the given direction. It's the radiation pattern, the polar plot. And uh, that's no super gain, perfectly traditional. Now, to create super gain, note this. Let this variable that appears, k or sine go to half theta, to be x. Then you've got that this, if you write the radiation function in terms of x, it's a band-limited function. And the largest Fourier coefficients 
uh, e to the plus or minus ix. Well, now we know. We have a lot of experience. We can create um, very easily super oscillatory functions that vary much faster than x and actually do anything you like, which I'll now show you. Suppose you desire a radiation pattern, f of x, here it is, psi of theta, whose Fourier transform is some function g. And let a be the um, Fourier variable. Okay. Now, if you choose a super oscillatory function, h super, which is uh, e to the i ax, there it is, a is greater than 1, and when x is very small, then, uh, for example, the one we've been discussing all the time, this uh, canonical super oscillatory function, and then you form the following. You form uh, your radiation pattern is this super oscillatory function, locally exponential but generally more complicated, um, times the Fourier transform of, the, um, of what you desire to achieve. Well then, for example, suppose you take, suppose you want a sync pattern with an arbitrary small width, w. That, so not a sync pattern with which determined by the width term of the wavelength, but a really narrow one with width w. Well, you know the Fourier transform of a sync function is a rectangle function, and so here you have, you integrate your super oscillatory function over a rectangle with this um, 1 over w, do the calculation, it's not, not, tr it's not uh, difficult, you can do it exactly, and then, and then you can look what happens for large n. So then what happens is you've got a sync function like you had before, but now you've got a width that delta theta is square root of w. So you've got a narrow, narrow, narrow um, radiation pattern. Let me show you it. Let's take an antenna with a number of oscillating sources, which is a quarter of a wavelength long, a really, really tiny thing. And let's ask for w being 1 40th. So you want to beat Rayleigh by a factor of 40. OK. Well, here we are. As you increase n, you get all kinds of stuff. When you get to 600, you've got this lovely narrow pattern. A quarter of a wavelength antenna. Very remarkable thing. But there's a penalty. You see, remember what this x is. Um, the sampled range is x less than kl, because of the physical nature of this uh, variable. kl, kl over 2. This must, uh, this must lie in the interval where the function is super oscillatory. You've got to be careful, because you know the function increases very much. Now, suppose you do achieve that. Then outside this interval, you get enormous values and they correspond to theta imaginary, so beyond backwards, if you like. Well, what that means physically is the near field of the oscillator. And that's the well-known inefficiency of super gain antennas. In order to achieve this uh, almost cancellation that gives this very needle-like narrow beam, you have to have enormously strong oscillators that almost cancel each other out. Um, I want to show you how that works. Um, uh, I say the individual A's are enormous in, in the superposition. And it results again from this destructive, almost destructive interference. Um, uh, one fortieth. Um, well, look, here's the range, and somewhere in here, this is X, somewhere in here is your radiation pattern. This is outside, this is the near field, 10 to the 158. Well, zoom in, uh, zoom in. Uh, to this little region, and then you see the sink pattern starting to go large around the edges, but uh, still, that's what you desire to have. So it's a, um, this is, I begin to be pessimistic, and this pessimism will grow in spite of the achievements I'm going to describe to you. These are not really used in practice, and there's a lot of literature about it. But now, I want to go to uh, Teraldo de Francia. And he was a wonderful optical scientist in Italy, and uh, he wrote this in 1952. He realized that the antenna people had something to teach the optics people. And here's this wonderful quotation. Fortunately, it appears that microwave researchers were not very much concerned, or perhaps even acquainted, with the old and well-established theorems of wave optics, according to which no material improvement over the uniform pupil, that's to do with focusing a lens, would have been possible. 
As a result, an entirely new theory has been set up which contains many revolutionary implications. So he realized that what the radar people had to say uh, was, um, was very, uh, uh, had implications in optics and you could in fact make focal spots arbitrarily small. Now, he wasn't concerned with an antenna with a radiation pattern. He was concerned with the Fourier thing, focal spot, but it's a similar thing. And he showed in his paper how by having a, uh, a plane where you had a series of rings, hollow rings, where the light could get through, you could arrange a few of those rings. He did it numerically and uh, approximately. So you could find that uh, you had a central spot surrounded by a, 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 a a, a dark region and then something very bright outside but this spot could be very very narrow. Now at that time the technology was not available to fabricate this super lens. In uh, 2000 Steve Lips and his colleagues in uh, the Technion did actually create one. They had better fabrication but still not that good. But now progress has advanced and there are much superior nanolithography techniques to actually produce these rings which are very precisely um, uh, uh, calculated their widths in order to give this uh, cancellation and uh, a group led by uh, Nikolai Zeludev including my now colleague Mark Dennis he was my student he went away to Southampton where these people are now he's back again in Bristol he was one of the editors one of the um, authors here um, they went much further, and they could go further than, uh, than before. And here's their super lens, super oscillatory lens. They had a wavelength of 600 nanometers, which is green light, I suppose. I'm not sure green. Anyway, so here it is. Now, this was, a ch this was found by a numerical optimization procedure. You change iteratively the sizes, the number of the rings, and look at the focal spot. If it gets bigger, you continue. If it doesn't, you go back. It's a kind of what's the word, Monte Carlo improvement scheme, quite complicated actually, and then they could make it, that was the thing. So here they got this focal spot. Now look, here's a wavelength. Here's much smaller than a wavelength. Okay, and uh, they, they first they looked at a slit with a scanning electron microscope. So this is much fun, you can actually see. Here's the slit, it's 100 nanometers across. So it's smaller than the wavelength 600. And uh, Here's where they look with the super oscillatory lens, and you can see it nicely. How about two slits? Well, again, with a super oscillatory lens, you can resolve these two slits, but with a normal lens, a conventional conical, conical, um, what's the word, confocal microscope, you don't separate them at all. So that's a very nice, uh, very nice uh, development. Um, here's another sample. Here's an image of a number of different holes. Uh, here's the wavelength, and here's uh, um, a few hundred um, uh, nanometers and, and, and much smaller, 41 nanometer spacing, tiny, tiny, less than a tenth of a wavelength. And uh, here's the conventional image, and you really see very little, actually. But with a super oscillatory lens, you can pretty well resolve everything. Not quite up here, but pretty well. So um, this works. It's a, it's a procedure. Its working is limited because as I repeat, the, s the regions outside get bigger and bigger and bigger. They sort of realize this, so naturally enough, they concentrate on what they can do rather than what they can't do, as we all do. But uh, if they would want to get much better resolution, then uh, I think they wouldn't succeed. Mark Dennis knew this and tried to persuade the authors, the people who wrote the paper, to make more modest claims than they actually did make. But still, this is real. and. Uh, uh, the fact that they don't emphasize that there will be limitations is uh, it's a side issue. Um, I think that's all I want to tell you today. Um, there are a number of different things I've said. Um, so I'm very happy for discussion. Yeah? Okay? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Because this overlaps considerably the work that you've done. I mean, I fully recognize that. But still, it's the way I like to think about it. Mm.
Well, one could have a lot of fun, <coughs> excuse me, looking at uh, pointers whose wave functions have different analytic structures beyond the three that I've chosen there. I said we did look at a few, which, which we didn't put in the paper. But, you know, you could have pointers which are, which are, uh, whose Fourier transform can be as decay as fast as you like. I mean, you could have a rectangle Fourier transform even if you wanted. And that would be a horrible sink function pointer. But, uh, I mean, I just, what, what I told you is enough to make the point that the Fourier transform must decay fast. Um, Michael, do you have a, uh, maybe a, a physical interpretation of the, the reason you had to have the rate um, cut down, the, the first topic you addressed. The, the reason? You needed to cut, you had to, there's only certain... Uh, um, Point of wave function? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a, yes. I mean, the physical interpretation is this. Um, the Fourier transform decaying fast is a point of wave function which is very broad. Right. Now, of course, you have to have that right. in order that all the contributions from the different eigenvalues can overlap and with judicious phasing can interfere destructively. Otherwise, right. you'll never get this resurrection far away. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Ikira has an interpretation concerning mm. causality, for example. If you didn't cut oh, it quickly enough. There's no time, so cause yeah. I don't know where causality fits That's in. Right. <laughs> there's no time in this, so yeah. then causality plays a role. Price that you pay for these super oscillatory lenses. You oh, can resolve less outside than less. the focal spot. You've got this clear region, it's a spot, but then outside that you've got enormous rings of very high intensity. Just like with antenna, right? Yeah, just that like it's the same thing. And that was Toraldo de Franchi's insight. He said, you know, we optics people have been hypnotized by this essentially what we would call the uncertainty principle that he also did, which is, you know, it, it goes back to it's the Rayleigh resolution limit. You have something of size d, you can't get an antenna which gives you uh, uh, angular angular uh, variation any uh, larger than, than d over lambda, you know. Yeah, so lambda over d, excuse me, lambda over d. So, so you have to have uh, a very large antenna, it was thought, or a large lens in order to get um, find deep directivity or, or um, a, a small focus, but it's not right. I mean, as it points out, there are ways to ways around it at a price. And that price would translate into a kind of analog of uh, uncertainty principle. When, let's say, if you keep increasing, increasing with antenna, right? Then, uh, no, that, it cannot happen that the outside region somehow merge with with no, the region which you want to merge, start. Just gets bigger. It, does it not. isn't the uncertainty principle. Okay. Uh, you see, the uncertainty principle is irrelevant to all this because when you once you're dealing with very small things. You see, the uncertainty principle tells you about relatively variances of functions, the Fourier function and the direct function. But the variance is a crude thing. It's an integral over the square. And little, tiny, fast, exponentially small variations are invisible to the, to the variance. So we're talking about things beyond the variance of functions to which the uncertainty principle certainly applies. Well, but you, have, you can have a generalization of uncertainty principle for your case, which will still put the limit to how small the lambda you can probe. There is no, no, there's no limit. There's no limit. Uh, the only point is that, uh, as has been explored in a number of contexts, but still, in my view, not with complete generality. It's awkward. Um, you can't avoid the fact, I mean, you can call this uncertainty, but it isn't really, that, that when the, the, the more the finer and more oscillations you have, the larger the function rises outside. I mean, I don't think, I mean, that's a kind of duality which is a bit like the uncertainty principle, but it isn't the uncertainty principle. It's something more, fi more refined. As I mentioned yesterday, people try to quantify this in terms of the total weight of the function. They somehow want it to be normalized, and then you can compare. But as I showed you yesterday, normalization is irrelevant. You can have functions which, uh, which have essentially the same super oscillations and rise to similar heights but when much, much farther away are either normalizable or not. So I think that's not really relevant. So something like the maximum height to which the function rises away from its super oscillation is what you'd want to compare, but it's not even that. And so I, I don't actually know of a, 
of a very completely general um, uh, uh, criteria. Of course, for particular functions, you can very precisely say what happens, like with the Bessel functions I showed yesterday, or with the canonical supraoscillatory function. Again, it's easy. You can work out how big things get far away in, in comparison with their smallness when they supraoscillate. But to have a, a way of describing this for all functions is not quite clear to me, not clear to me at all. And uh, one more question. When you were talking about uh, finding the condition for those pointer functions for Fourier transform, yes, they have to decay fast enough. Yes, decay, but... So you don't have a general theorem, you have examples. No, no, but you can immediately see that it must depend on the way in which the Fourier transform decays. That's, that's, it has to decay fast enough to cancel the anti-Gaussian. But how that happens is different for different types of function. Right, but the reason why I'm asking, when you had that anti-Gaussian function, you expanded, you had an exponent, sine squared plus cosine squared, you yeah. expanded Taylor yeah. series, all of them, and matched the second power. Yeah. You didn't say anything about the fourth power. No, no, but we... we so we, it's only necessary condition, it's not sufficient condition. Yeah, well, it, right? it, 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 well right, in the paper we do, we look ah. in more detail. In particular, we go all the way because we look halfway where the thing is very is very large and we, we, we calculate the size of that contribution so we do actually uh, we go even beyond the fourth power well I, I'm right and because I did notice that you have sine squared plus cos sine squared so it's a finite yeah. function yeah, 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 yeah. there's no problem with divergences it's no, just no, you no, match only the first right right nothing just it's all it's all precise but you just have to go to the order that you need to get to to see the phenomenon because then there's corrections but it don't matter that much and, the, of course, the test is doing those calculations and seeing the point of super shift. You know, we see it happening. Those calculations are exact. They're not, they don't use the approximate theory. To make sure that I understood the terminology, mm. pointer is just like probe function, right? Mm? Like probe function, pointers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. First of all, this was a very nice um, exposition of the shortcomings of these continuous pointers and the super mm. oscillations, these exponential regions yeah, that you yeah. can't avoid. It's very nice to see that caution stated so clearly. But I was curious, have you thought about um, discrete pointers, which no. people are also using, and they show these super shifts? I was curious what the... Oh, you the could. I mean, we didn't. No, of course you could, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Pe people have done it. I'm curious, what are the analogs of this caution? That different, actually. You know, I mean, maybe a bit more complicated. In some cases, it may even be simpler. But uh, so the pointer spectrum will be a discrete spectrum. You know, so uh, I mean, if the pointer is on a circle, like a clock, right? That's of course continuous. But then the Fourier transform is discrete. Right. Okay. And you could clearly have the other way, do the other way around, I and mean, you could do. I didn't think about it. Yeah, I asked just because uh, people are using spin half systems, like yes. polarization, as pointers and getting weak values out of them. And so I was wondering, ah, what is the penalty I'll ah, there? I'll talk about that tomorrow. Ah, Sorry, good, uh, tomorrow good. We'll, we'll come to that. Yes. Excellent. Yes, tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. And I did mention that the two, well, the two state system I mentioned was, of course, the, the system, not the pointer, but. Uh, Something about two states tomorrow. tomorrow. A, lot, a lot about two states tomorrow, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.